So far, we discussed 2D object detection techniques. But of course, our world is three-dimensional and therefore it's important for self-driving vehicles to perceive the environment in three-dimensional space and to detect objects in 3D. And this brings us to 3D object detection, which we will discuss in this unit. The goal of 3D object detection is to predict a 3D bounding box for each and every object of interest in the scene. For example, here on the right, we have this orange 3D box prediction and the green box indicates the ground truth for that particular object here. The performance of 3D object detection algorithms can be evaluated similarly to the 2D case by defining a 3D intersection over union metric and computing average precision based on that 3D intersection over union, where now the intersection, <clears throat> for example, is not um, computed with respect to the areas of these 2D boxes as in the 2D case, but with respect to the 3D volumes of these two cuboids highlighted here in yellow. Let's first have a look at the different parameterizations of 2D and 3D object detection. In the 2D case, the goal was to find a 2D box which can be parameterized with four values, the XY location in the image domain, as well as the width and the height of that box. In the 3D case, the location is a three-dimensional coordinate, an XYC coordinate, and the 3D box has a width, a height, and a length parameter. And in addition, we have three rotation parameters, roll, pitch, and yaw. So overall, we have nine parameters to estimate in the general 3D object detection case. However, when considering self-driving, an assumption that's commonly made is that objects, vehicles are driving on the road, on a planar road surface. And so we can assume a zero roll and zero pitch and remove these two parameters so that we are only estimating the yaw angle and reducing this estimation problem to a seven dimensional estimation problem. Still, 3D detection is much harder. There's more parameters and it's a much harder problem. There's more that can go wrong. And also the difficulty depends on the input. For example, regressing a 3D box from just a 2D image, from just the projection into the image domain as input is much harder than doing this from a LiDAR 3D point cloud, for example. This is also illustrated here. A 2D box in the image, this red one here, for example, corresponds to a frustum. This red thing here is called a frustum in three-dimensional space. And the object can be located anywhere inside that frustum. In general, the objects that are visible in the image can be located anywhere in the camera viewing frustum. That means that objects of different scales and distances may look exactly the same. If you look at this bunny here, if I have a bunny at a small distance that's small, and if I now increase the size of the bunny and put it at a larger distance, it projects to exactly the same pixel values, to exactly the same image. So there's a scale ambiguity here. Now, luckily in the case of self-driving, this is something we can learn to resolve through machine learning because cars typically tend to be between four and six meters long, etc. So there's typical sizes that we observe. And so by knowing that a car in a physical world has a typical size, we can still get cues about, for example, the distance to a car just by looking at um, the size of the 2D projection of that car. Still, the difficulty depends on the input modality and by far the hardest task is to regress 3D boxes from monocular images as illustrated here, because this requires very good object size priors and still it's hard. In particular at the far range, it's very hard to predict the location of a 3D box from just a monocular RGB image as illustrated here precisely.
If we have two images, a stereo camera, then this helps to localize the box in 3D space, of course. But if you remember from the reconstruction lecture, we have a quadratic increase in arrow with distance. And so it's still not as accurate as if we would have a 3D point cloud from, for example, a radar or LiDAR scanner. In contrast to image sensors, LiDAR sensors are sparse but provide good 3D accuracy also at far range, as shown here. So localization becomes much easier. However, due to their sparsity, they have a lower resolution. So it could be harder to detect small objects like pedestrians. And we'll see that in a bit. That's the reason why several methods also try to combine both modalities as they provide complementary cues, complementary information. They're trying to combine images and LiDAR. Let's now look at each of these. I will show you examples for each of these categories in each of these three categories. And we'll start with the image based 3D object detection category, which is the hardest to predict 3D bonding boxes, metric 3D bonding boxes from just a single image. The first method I'd like to show you is called Monocular 3D Object Detection for Autonomous Driving, published in CVPR 2016. And the idea here is to sample candidate 3D boxes on the ground plane and remove all the 3D boxes that are in non-road areas. So we first do a semantic segmentation of the input image and we assume the camera at a certain height and inclination angle. Maybe that has been calibrated beforehand. So we have a virtual ground plane that we can assume. And then we project the semantic segmentation onto that ground plane. That's what you can see here. We ignore the road area and sample 3D boxes of typical sizes of 3D cars. So we build a 3D car model, a model of like, that has the size of typical 3D cars. And so we sample these cars in this gray areas here. Now we have cars at plausible 3D location and with plausible 3D sizes sampled in 3D space, but it's a lot of 3D boxes. These are just proposals. So we project them into the image plane in order to extract features. And what has been done here in this early work was to use a feature-based scoring mechanism that's based on features such as semantic class information and semantic instance information, the contour and the shape and the context so these are simple features that take into account shape and context information, as well as very generic priors about the location of the vehicle, typically. So if you have a big data set, you can, of course, create like these heat maps here where vehicles in, in the bird's eye view and in the image typically occur. And so based on these features, they re-rank these hypotheses and then for the top ranking ones, they do a final scoring and a 2D refinement using a fast RCNN in the 2D image domain to retain the 3D proposals that are most likely. So it's basically a technique that, that first samples in 3D and through that sampling process automatically constrains the location and the sizes of the cars to be plausible but then does the classification and detection actually in the 2D image space. This is a more recent technique. It's called Geometric Based Distance Decomposition for Monocular 3D Object Detection at ICCV 2021. The idea here is to improve what is the hardest for monocular 3D object detection to improve localization. And the main problem is that regressing depth is really, really hard. So what they do here is they, they observe that there's this relationship between the distance to the object and the actual 3D height of the object and the height in the image domain of the 2D bounding box. And so that what they do is they regress both the physical capital H and the image height plus uncertainties and then fuse those in an optimal way to yield a better depth estimate. And so they show that in addition to a classical region-based proposal mechanism here, like faster RCNN adapted to the 3D space, 
they can uh, significantly boost performance that way. And so here are some results from this technique. Now remember that this is all computed just from a monocular RGB image, just the image that you see on the left. So it's quite impressive, I think. Another idea to use a monocular image or maybe a stereo pair is to first predict a depth map using a stereo matching algorithm or if there's just a monocular image using a mono depth stereo net, a mono depth network. And then back project that depth map into a 3D point cloud, which the authors call a pseudo LIDAR point cloud, because then you can apply standard point-based, LIDAR-based 3D detection algorithms directly to this pseudo-LIDAR uh, pseudo point cloud. And what the authors of this paper, pseudo-LIDAR from Visual Depth Estimation, claim is that this performance is then competitive with LIDAR-based detectors. So this paper had a big splash in the community because it was believed that 3D detection from monocular images is much harder than LiDAR-based detection. And so this was really um, astonishing to many. But then more recently, there has been a discussion about this around this topic because there's not that much prior knowledge actually that, that's incorporated into this approach. There's no magic happening here. So why should this work so much better than, I mean, going through this depth map than directly regressing 3D boxes from the image? And it has been recently found that some of these um, improvements have actually been gained through some uh, quirks in, in the evaluation and not uh, correspond to actual performance improvements. And if, you, if you're interested in this discussion, I, I, I'm happy to refer you to this paper from Simonelle et al. at ICCB 2021. But it's another example of how you could uh, utilize just a monocular or stereo image in order to first compute a 3D point cloud and then apply a 3D object detection algorithm on that 3D point cloud. And this brings us directly already to LiDAR-based 3D object detection, where the input is such a either pseudo LiDAR point cloud or real LiDAR point cloud from a LiDAR scanner. However, learning with point clouds poses some unique challenges compared to learning from images where we know how to deal with the image domain by using, for example, 2D confnets. The first challenge is that the learned model must accommodate point clouds of arbitrary size. So if I subsample the point cloud, if I remove every other point, I still want to have a, a similar result, a similar answer. And of course, um, different LiDAR point clouds have different number of points. So first of all, my algorithm must be able to handle this. And for example, a multi-layer perceptron would not. It would assume a fixed input vector dimension. So that's not a feasible model. The second challenge is that the learned model needs to be invariant to all n factorial permutations as illustrated here. So if we have this point cloud, it's basically a set, a point cloud is a set. So if we have this set as an input, then this represents the same set as this one here. It doesn't depend which index each point has in the input representation, in the input space of my model. And so the model that we built and uh, the revolution that PointNet fostered or started was um, to think about this set representations. So we want a representation, a model that treats both of them exactly the same way. And for example, a max operator would be a function that is invariant to permutations or the average or addition operator is invariant. But of course, uh, this alone is not enough. Um, it's not a neural network. We can't learn any parameters with just that. And finally, the learned model should also be invariant to rotations of the point cloud because the object is always the same no matter how I orient it. So we should incorporate this as well. And this is really where everything started with a paper called PointNet, where we tried to apply 
um, deep neural networks to point clouds on free tasks, classification, part segmentation, and semantic segmentation. In classification, the goal is to predict a category label for an entire point cloud. And in semantic segmentation, we want to predict a semantic class label for each point of that point cloud. So it's not directly the 3D detection problem, but it's a foundation of many of the 3D detection models that are out there um, that operate on LiDAR point clouds. And that's why it's important to understand this first. So how does PointNet work? Here's the architecture of PointNet. PointNet applies a multi-layer perceptron per point. These are these little boxes here. They have shared parameters, but they are applied per point. So they take a single three-dimensional point and project that point into a 64-dimensional feature space. And they do this independently for each point. But the parameters of this model is shared. And here, in a second stage of this algorithm, they take a 64-dimensional feature vector of that point and transform that into a 1024-dimensional feature vector, again, independently per point. After that, um, point net does a, applies a max pooling operation, which is where this permutation invariance comes into play. In order to obtain a global feature vector, of the same dimension, 1024. And then a final global MLP to do either classification or taking these global features. So this is for the classification task. But if you want to do semantic segmentation, you take these features, these global features, and concatenate them with some per point local features and pass them through some more point net layers in order to predict an output score per um, point. In addition, there's this input transformation and feature transformation blocks here that you can see here, which inside these blocks, again, use small little point nets that are called t-net here. So these t-nets are something like, um, you know, this entire blue block here, but just replicated in a small block and more shallow. And they are predicting a, a transformation, in this case, a three by three transform, in this case, a 64 by 64 transform. So they are predicting an affine transformation that's applied again independently per point. And so this helps in, in you know this helps in learning these geometric invariances, for example, rotation invariance. Now this is an interesting model, right? So it's worth thinking about it a little bit. Why why does this actually work? Um, but training this end to end works quite well actually. Um, despite the fact that here we, we do a couple of these processing steps independently per point while sharing the features of the network, projecting these points successively into higher dimensional feature spaces, and then applying this max pooling operation to yield a global feature that's then um, projected using an MLP to a class label. One downside of PointNet is that it doesn't capture local structures and depends on global coordinates, right? So here, every point is a global point coordinate. And so one follow-up innovation from the same group was PointNet++, which applies PointNet recursively, as you can see here, on nested partitions of the point set. So for example, this uh, point here has a receptive field that's indicated by these dashed lines here. And this has a receptive field indicated by the dashed lines here. And so successively, it's aggregating stronger features through this nested partitioning. And it learns features with increasing contextual scales. So you can think of this as a multi-scale point net. And similar to point net, it has a decoder for semantic segmentation or an MLP for classification. Now, this was about object or about image well, point cloud classification and semantic segmentation. How can we now use this for 3D detection? And one method I want to show you in this context is called point RCNN, faster RCNN for point clouds. 
I call this faster RCN and for point clouds. This is not the paper title. The paper title is 3D object proposal generation and detection from point cloud. But I call this faster RCN for point clouds as it's basically doing exactly the same as faster RCNN, but for point clouds. It has a proposal stage here in blue that generates a set of 3D box proposals that is ideally over complete. And then it has a 3D box refinement stage where a, a 3D box uh, offset is predicted as well as a confidence to yield the final 3D detections. Let's now go over these two stages individually. So this is the, the first stage, the top part here. What do we have here? Well, first we have a backbone here, this point cloud encoder and the point cloud decoder that learns discriminative point-wise features using a standard point net plus plus. So this is just a point net plus plus that gives us per point features for each point on this point cloud. And then we have a 3D box proposal regression module here that's similar to faster RCNN, the first stage of this two stage faster RCNN, but for point clouds. And um, another module uh, that predicts uh, foreground versus background. And what they use is a combination of regression and classification plus regression losses. Classif with classification plus regression, I mean they, for example, for the spatial coordinate in bird's eye view, they, for every point, they define a local coordinate system and then they discretize that local coordinate space and first do a classification of the location of the object in which bin it should be and then an additional regression where exactly in that bin. And so they, this is a common trick that's often done when um, you know, direct regression is uh, not uh, it's not working well because um, we we have to deal with you know multimodal distributions etc. So you can use this trick, and uh, this is what they do. This is what they call bin-based loss. Okay, so so they do this 3D box proposal regression, and then they pass the top 100 proposals, the ones that they are most confident in, to the next box refinement stage, which is illustrated here. So you can see it takes the point coordinates, the semantic features, the foreground mask, and the 3D region of interests of the proposals as input. And then in a first stage, it pulls all the 3D point features based on the 3D box proposals. So simply aggregates all the features inside the, any of these 3D proposal boxes, like the orange one here. And this leads uh, uh, to a set of uh, semantic features and local spatial points. Then in a second stage, these local spatial point coordinates are transformed <clears throat> into a local 3D box relative coordinate representation to have them in a canonical coordinate system. They are transformed from global to relative to that orange box here and then merged with the semantic features and fed as, an in as input to a point cloud encoder that then does the 3D box refinement by predicting residuals similar to the second stage in faster RCNN. And again, it's using a combination of regression and classification plus regression losses. And this gives the final 3D boxes as output. So here are some results of this method. You can see <coughs> um, that's a, that is able to uh, detect the objects in 3D uh, quite well. And while it's it's using, of course, only point clouds as input, here it's evaluated on the Kitty data set where um, uh, images are available. So we can also project the 3D box into the image, but the image hasn't been used as an input to the model. An interesting observation from this table here at the bottom, where we see uh, average precision numbers for different IOU thresholds, is that this point RCNN method outperforms multimodal methods often. So we have some methods here that combine RGB and LiDAR, and this method is better than those previous ones, except for pedestrians, which are small. So for pedestrians, it's sometimes hard to detect them in LiDAR point clouds because there's just so few points that lie on these objects 
So if you have an image information that can help you there. But in general, LiDAR is by far the most important <coughs> input modality. And there's uh, little that you can gain except for very small objects if you add uh, image information, at least if you have an expensive HDL64 Velodyne LiDAR. An alternative to this point net um, model that I just showed is to encode points into a voxel representation and then use 3D convolutions. And this is what has been followed in this paper, VoxelNet end-to-end -end learning for point cloud-based 3D object detection, which also received quite some attention at CVPR 2018 because it was one of the very few papers from the Apple team. Apple is, uh, as a company, typically not known for publishing a lot of their results, but this is a paper that they have published, um, which obviously came out of their self-driving effort. And so what they did is basically they they first partition the input space into a set of voxels and then convert the points that fall into these voxels into features for these voxels and then apply 3D convolutions on that voxel space. And then do some, uh, they have a basically a single stage detector based on these features. So they, they say here, this is a region proposal network, but actually the region proposal network is proposing directly the, the, free, the 3D box output. So it's not a two stage detector, it's a single stage detector. Now this also works, um, but of course it requires a large amount of memory and compute because you, you have to work in a, a large 3D volume. Another idea is to use a 2D bird's eye view representation instead, which is much more memory and computation efficient and has been followed, for example, in work called Pixor and HDNet, as shown here. So the idea is to represent LiDAR information and possibly also <clears throat> a roadmap that can be used as auxiliary information to help object detection, as has been shown in HDNet. So it can serve as a strong prior that can boost 3D detection performance. Um, so to represent that in 2D bird's eye view. And the way this is done for the LiDAR is to treat the C dimension as a feature channel. To discretize the C space, this is the up coordinate, into different bins and use these as the feature channel because then you can use efficient 2D convolutions instead of applying 3D convolutions. And uh, yeah, this is what has been done, for example, in, in HDNet, exploiting HD maps for 3D object detection. But it has been also shown that if you supplement this LiDAR point cloud with a map, for example, a high definition, an HD map, um, where you have localized yourself in that map, then this map priors can help you remove implausible or invalidate implausible 3D detections from your 3D detector and gain better performance. And now finally, in the final part of this unit, I want to show you some works in the area of multimodal fusion or multimodal 3D object detection. And the first work is called Frustum Point Nets for 3D object detection from RGBD data at CVPR 2018. The idea here is to generate a 2D object proposals in the RGB image first. So what they do is they take the LiDAR scan, project the LiDAR points into the image domain, uh, as shown here and the top. What you can see here color coded is the depth. And then you can combine this LiDAR image, the projection, with the RGB image and use that with a standard 2D CNN to obtain 2D object proposals like in faster RCNN. And what they do then is then they compute the object frustum corresponding to the proposal 2D bounding boxes as illustrated here. And they consider all the 3D points that lie inside that frustum and predict a 3D bounding box from those points inside that frustum. So it's, it's, it's doing a little bit of fusion here in the first object proposal detection step. And also, of course, it, it uses this um, RGB color to colorize the point clouds. But then it's really a two-stage mechanism where in the first stage in the image domain proposals are generated and then in a 3D domain with a point net, these proposals are validated. 
So here's a little bit more details. The 3D box prediction problem is split into three stages. In the first stage, highlighted in red here, um, the method segments the RGB point cloud into object and background. It basically tries to extract the object and remove the clutter as illustrated here at the bottom. This is the input and this is the output. Then in the second stage here, the points are translated such that the centroid of the point cloud aligns with the 3D box center. Because if you learn in this canonical space, then learning 3D detection is of course easier. So we try to learn this alignment jointly end to end. And then in the final step here, step three, the 3D bonding box uh, regression happens where we regress the X, Y, Z and um, width, height and length and also the yaw angle to yield the final 3D bonding box. Another example for multimodal fusion for fusing RGB image and LiDAR information is MV3D, Multi-View 3D Object Detection Network for Autonomous Driving. Again, it's a work that's based on the popular two-stage object detection framework where we have a 3D proposal network and a region-based fusion network here at the end. In a first step, this method generates 3D proposals from the LiDAR bird's eye view. So we're generating a set of 3D proposals here in this proposal generating step and then project them into the LiDAR bird's eye view, the LiDAR front view. This is basically an image corresponding to the RGB image. But the domain corresponds to the RGB image. But what we see here is the LiDAR points projected into that image domain. This is called the LiDAR front view. And we also project this 3D proposal into the RGB image. And so of course, each of these input, these three different input modalities has a, um, a convolutional network to extract features. And then we can apply ROI pooling just like in faster RCNN to extract those features in these projected um, regions here. And then we fuse the ROI pooled features from all modalities using this fusion mechanism, which is uh, iterating between uh, splitting, doing some computation per branch, and then um, computing a, a mean pooling here of these modalities. So we have this specific fusion mechanism. And at the end, we have a hat where we regress the class and also the box residuals. So again, it's a classical proposal plus refinement two-stage pipeline. And so here we can see some results. And again, from this table, we can see that if we add the monocular image queue to the LiDAR queue, we gain something, but it's not quite as dramatic as we might hope for. So for example, at an intersection of Un uh, intersection over union threshold of 0 0.5, which is a standard threshold, we gain maybe 0 0.8 percentage points here and 1.5 percentage points here. So we gain something, but LiDAR is by far the most important cue for 3D object detection as also found in this paper. So here's some results. Unfortunately, quality is not great. Um, but I, I guess you get the gist. That brings me to the end of this lecture. Let me conclude. In summary, we've seen in this lecture that localizing and recognizing objects is crucial for self-driving. However, there are many possible boxes if we consider continuous values, then there's even infinitely many possible boxes. And also the number of objects is unknown, which makes this problem hard. Furthermore, we have to deal with appearance and viewpoint variations, illumination changes, clutter, occlusion, and all these other challenges. 
We've also seen that detection performance is typically measured using what we call average precision. And uh, classic sliding window detection methods use handcrafted features, which are suboptimal. We have seen that deep learning has boosted recognition performance by 10x in just a few years. And two stage detection methods like faster RCNN and mask RCNN, or their 3D variants, are dominating today. We've also seen that feature pyramid networks help detecting features at various scales. And finally, in this last unit, we've discussed that 3D detection methods rely either on RGB images, LiDAR point clouds, or both. But LiDAR information is crucial for accurate 3D localization.